Welcome to Lesson 11b, Boundary Conditions for the Navier-Stokes Equation. In this lesson, we'll discuss how to determine the required number of boundary conditions for a given set of differential equations. Then we'll discuss several types of boundary conditions that we commonly encounter in fluid flow problems, and I'll do some example problems. For a given set of equations, how do we know how many boundary conditions are required? The answer is that for each variable, for each coordinate, by that I mean x, y, z, or t, the number of required boundary conditions is equal to the highest order derivative of that coordinate. The wording may not be clear until we do some examples. For our first example, I'll make up a set of equations. Here we have two variables. a is a function of x and t, and b is a function of x. And we have two equations since we have two variables. So using our definition above, let's pick variable a and coordinate t. Since this is first order, for t we need one boundary condition, which we'll actually call an initial condition, typically for time. For x, this is second order. So since second order is the highest order derivative for x, we need two boundary conditions. Now we repeat for the other variables. Here there's only one other one, b. And b is only a function of x. We'll need two boundary conditions, since this is second order which is the highest order derivative. There's also a del b del x, but we don't count that one since we've already counted this one as 2. If we look back at a, this is second order and there is no del a del x term, but we still need 2 because of this second order derivative. And for b, we need 2 because of this second order derivative. Our answer then is that we need 5 total boundary conditions just by adding these up. I want to just mention that for this first boundary condition, when we say for t we need one boundary condition or initial condition, that means that at all x locations in our domain, we specify a at some time t, typically t equals 0. And then for x, we need two boundary conditions. So at one x, we specify a at all times. And for a second x, we specify a at all times. Since b is only a function of x, we specify b at one x and then at another x since we need two of them. Let's do another example. Let's use the Coet problem, which we discussed in a previous lesson. The continuity equation reduced to del v del y equals 0, and the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation reduced to rho v del u del y equal mu del squared u del y squared. Again, following our statement above, we see that u is only a function of y, and v is only a function of y here. So for variable u, for y, we need two boundary conditions. Since this is second order, we have a del u del y, but we don't worry about that one since we're counting this as our highest order derivative. Here's the two boundary conditions we picked at y equals 0, u equals 0, and at y equal h, u equal capital V. Recall we were solving this problem. Flow between two plates with the top plate moving at speed v and the bottom plate stationary, where y is measured from the bottom wall. These are both no slip conditions. Now consider variable v. For y, we need only one boundary condition, since v appears here in first order. v also appears in this term, but we're looking only at derivatives to calculate the number of boundary conditions. We pick this boundary condition at y equals 0, v equals 0. In other words, there's no flow through the wall. By the way, this height was h, the distance between the two plates. We also wrote that v equals 0 at y equal h, but that boundary condition was not necessary since we only needed one for v. Adding up these two, our answer is that we need three total boundary conditions. I'll do a third example where I'll make up a set of two differential equations. Here we have two variables a and b. a is a function of x, and b is a function of x, z, and t. So for variable a and for coordinate x, we need one since the highest order derivative is first order. For b and for coordinate x, we look for the highest order derivative in x, and we see that it is also 1. So we need one boundary condition. For z, we look for the highest order derivative in z, which is 2 since this is second order. And finally, for t, there's only one derivative of b with respect to t and its first order. So we need one boundary condition. Again, add these up, and we need five total bcs. Keep in mind that I'm using the term boundary condition to also mean initial conditions when we have time involved. I'm treating x, y, z, and t all as coordinates here, because mathematically these are all 
independent variables, and our capital A and capital B are dependent variables. Knowing the correct number of required boundary conditions is important when we do fluid flow problems where we're solving the Navier-Stokes equation along with the continuity equation, especially when we have several variables. And if it's 3D and unsteady, our variables will be functions of x, y, z, and t. Now let's look at the types of boundary conditions for fluid flows. We're already familiar with the no-slip condition. This applies tangent to a wall. The velocity of the fluid has to equal the velocity of the wall. Using coet flow as a simple example again, the no-slip condition tells us that at y equals 0, u equals 0 since this bottom wall is stationary, and at y equal h, u equal v since that wall is moving. We typically use this tangent to a wall. There's another boundary condition normal to the wall, which has the same equation. The fluid velocity must equal the wall velocity. But if you're thinking of normal to the wall, there can be no flow through a wall, since a wall is solid. For coet flow, at y equals 0, v equals 0, and at y equal h, v equals 0. As we said previously, there's no flow through this wall and no flow through this wall. Since this is a vector equation, it actually includes both u and v in it if it's a two-dimensional flow. So these two boundary conditions are really one boundary condition split up into tangent and normal. Now let's talk about an interface boundary condition. Suppose we have fluid A that's interfacing fluid B, where this is the interface. Well, the velocity vectors VA and VB must be equal at the interface, similar to what happens at a wall. If we think of fluid elements right at the interface, shear stress tau on the top face of the lower element we'll call tau A, and tau B is the shear stress at the bottom of the top element. Since these two particles are rubbing against each other, tau A must equal tau B at this interface. They're equal but opposite because of the way we define shear stress. At the top, a positive shear stress is to the right, and at the bottom of a particle, positive shear stress is to the left. Another way of thinking about it is that this blue fluid A feels a stress that's dragging it to the right, while the green fluid B feels an equal and opposite stress that's dragging it to the left. What about pressure? If the interface is flat, no curvature, then the pressures must be equal, PA equal PB. If the interface is curved, surface tension effects may be significant, especially if there's high curvature. In this case, PB is greater than PA. Think about a soap bubble, for example, where there's air inside at some higher pressure than that of the soapy water of this film. If we limit our discussion to a flat interface at a surface of a liquid and a gas, we call that a free surface. So we're talking about a situation where we have a liquid with a surface that has a gas above the liquid. If these are our x and y components, then at this free surface, u of the liquid must equal u of the gas. Since there's no curvature, p liquid must equal p gas. And shear stresses, tau liquid, must equal tau gas. Let's look at this one more closely. For a 2D problem like this, tau of the liquid will be the viscosity of the liquid times del u del y of the liquid, and we'll set that equal to the viscosity of the gas times del u del y gas, since tau is mu del u del y for simple 2D shear problems like this. In general, the velocity profiles will look something like this. This is u of y for the liquid, and I drew a slope here at the free surface. In the gas, the profile may look something like this, where the speed is the same at the interface, but the slope del u del y is much sharper or larger. Consider an open channel of some liquid with air on top. The liquid is trying to drag the air along, and the air is trying to slow down the liquid. By the way, this equation works also for two liquids or two gases, where you have an interface instead of a free surface. But for the case of liquids and gases, typically mu liquid is much greater than mu gas. So when we look at this equation, we can make an approximation. If we know that mu liquid is much greater than mu gas, then the gas has virtually no effect on the liquid. So the liquid can flow at constant speed right up to the free surface. There will be a tiny little dip here, and then the gas will have a very thin film where the gas is also moving to the right since these two speeds have to be the same at the interface. Thinking about this equation, 
The mu here is large, and the slope is small. And on the right side, mu is small, and the slope is large, so that these two are equal. But as mu liquid gets much, much bigger than mu gas, this derivative has to get much smaller, and this one has to get much larger. In the limit, we could ignore the gas flow and let the speed here just come up to the interface with a zero slope. So at our liquid gas interface, if the liquid is not a constant speed like this, it will still have a zero slope at the interface. If y is vertical in this diagram, the boundary condition is that del u del y of the liquid is approximately zero. In other words, this slope is zero. This is analogous to temperature at an insulated wall, where if we plot temperature as a function of distance, it might look something like this, where again the slope is zero at the wall if this is perfectly insulated. A similar thing happens with u at a free surface. Now let's talk about inlet boundary conditions. If this is our flow domain, and flow enters from the left, this would be an inlet. Typically we specify the velocity at the inlet. In some problems we specify pressure at the inlet instead. When we talk about computational fluid dynamics CFD, we'll find that for incompressible flow calculations, you can do either one or the other, but not both. A similar thing happens at an outlet. For the same flow domain, suppose this is the outlet. We can specify V at the outlet, or specify P at the outlet. This latter case is more typical for CFD solutions. Or, you can specify straight outflow. Namely, instead of specifying V itself, you specify that del V del S is zero, where S is the coordinate normal to the outlet. With this boundary condition in terms of the derivative with respect to S, velocity component U or V, would have to have zero slope as it approaches that boundary. We can also specify a symmetry boundary condition. Suppose we're trying to find the velocity profile in a 2D channel, and we know that this profile is symmetric about this symmetry plane, then there's no need to calculate both halves. We can calculate this bottom half and specify a boundary condition at the symmetry plane. So in a sense, we solve half the problem at this symmetry plane we would set del u del y equals zero, where again our xy plane is in the page here. We would also set del p del y equals zero, but v must be zero since there can be no flow across this symmetry plane. So these are the conditions you would apply at the symmetry plane. Again, when we get into CFD, this becomes important because with a symmetry plane, you can cut your computational time in half. Finally, I'll mention initial conditions you define all variables at some time, which is typically at t equals zero, so we call it an initial condition. And then you could march forward in time and allow all these other variables to change with time, but limited by these other boundary conditions at walls and outlets and inlets and symmetry planes and interfaces, etc. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.